By the time we reached Susie's flat, Jovla had pronounced himself ready for the final act. As he dragged her to the chamber, he called over his shoulder to the stick. Tell New York I'll be up for an hour. Susie wondered if Jovla might give me a few cigarettes so I could remain in a fug at the breakfast bar while they got torrid. No, no, he's part of the scene, he said. He leered at me like a randy bandit and waved a box of cigarettes under my nose. Fancy one? I did. Then you must witness the tup. With that, he shoved Susie onto her four-poster and started to savage her bodice. Stick sat me down on the floor. It's where they usually sit, he said, and wrote feverishly as he spoke. I glanced up to behold Jovla, now naked and kneeling before a slightly ripped-looking Susie. Gobble my stoppard, he ordered, and fell on her in such a way as to bring this about. As he pushed himself into her face, Jovla turned to me and said, How does it feel to see the woman you love being plugged by me? An unborn scream burst in my stomach and spread like cold mercury through my chest. I put my hands over my face but kept looking through my fingers. Write that down, he panted to the stick. Visibly destroyed but can't look away. Then he whipped Susie round so her forehead slapped the wall and declared, Mr. Stoppard will shortly be entering his box. Hammering continued for ghastly minutes until the mobile phone which Jovla had gaffered to his buttock chirped a manic arpeggio. He ripped it upwards, listened, stopped mid-thrust and shouted, Not now, mammoth, I'm fucking. Then he beamed the hideous grin of the undeservedly successful and slapped Susie quite hard around the face to celebrate. Now I could turn away, and to the sounds of this dubious pleasure, I began to ponder a vague tumescence of my own. Eventually, with a series of pathetic squeaks, the playwright emptied himself in the region of Susie's chest and armpit. She didn't seem to notice. By this stage, she was mainly asleep. He lit a cigarette and ordered his amanuensis to read back his notes. Good, he said frequently, and, hmm, Pinter, before dropping the butt in my lap and pronouncing himself pleased with a decent first draft. Then he told the stick to leak the mammoth episode to the Sunday Times. I'll deny it in my next interview, he said. That's how it's done. Leave now, he said to me, and the stick prodded me through to a large sofa where I dragged urgently on the soggy filter. Through the stripped pine, I could hear Susie, awake now and softly sobbing, accompanied by the fart of his voice, which had taken on a new, almost pleading tone. I hate the slapping too, he was saying. It's just that, well, it really is the thing now, you know. Three hours later, he was gone, and I was asleep in the bed next to Susie. She called me in to cover the damp patch. I slept fitfully, tormented by febrile visions of a Jovla rampant, until Jovla's voice jolted me too. It was mumbling through the answer phone. D'Souza, it was saying. You do love me, don't you? Yeah, I I'm sure you do, yeah. All right, good. Uh, hope you're not too, you know. And, uh, hey, it was, uh, it was, uh, a voice behind him prompted something inaudible. Yeah, it was a fuck supreme. You are the Marquis of Muff. <laughs> there was a loud clunk but the phone didn't ring off. And for some minutes I heard Jovla explaining to the stick how this last phrase would work at the National and would be quoted by 20% of the audience in the interval. And he would hear it because he has a special window for listening.